Good morning, everyone. On behalf of our board of directors, welcome and thank you for tuning in for this historic grand opening of the new Gift of Life Center for Cell and Gene Therapy. Our leadership is committed to ensuring that we at Gift of Life do our part to change the paradigm in the field of stem cell transplantation and advance the burgeoning field of cell and gene therapy. Last year, Gift of Life made history with the grand opening of its Dr. Miriam and Sheldon G. Adelson Collection Center. Today, we embark on the next phase in our journey to save lives. And I'm so proud to join you for a first look at this incredible state-of-the-art facility. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our good friend, Scott Singer, mayor of the city of Boca Raton for remarks, followed by our ribbon cutting. Good morning, I'm Boca Raton Mayor Scott Singer, and on behalf of my city council colleagues and the entire city of Boca Raton, I wanted to say how excited we are to be here at Gift of Life and the opening of the Center for G Cell and Gene Therapy. It means so much to our community to have this wonderful nonprofit here and cutting that technology that twice in the last 15 months has been brought to our city, putting us on the map because of everyone involved in Gift of Life. How many lives will be saved here is untold, but what it means for our community is so, so great. And it's not just abstract lives that are being saved. I have a personal connection to Gift of Life. My mother-in-law, Eleonora, was saved because of a stem cell transplant and match that was made possible by Gift of Life. And it all comes down to the vision of one man who started this wonderful organization and why we're so excited to be here today as Boca Raton and Gift of Life continue to be at the forefront of technology for the entire world. So please, let's welcome the man whose vision has turned a long-standing dream into a reality. Gift of Life's founder, Jay Feinberg. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. We really appreciate having you here. So thrilled, and once again, right, because we just completed uh, upstairs about a year and a half ago, and now we've got the milestone down here. So thank you so much. Um, the, uh, the Dr. Miriam and Sheldon G. Adelson Gift of Life Be the Match Collection Center um, was really extraordinary on the sixth floor, and we're hoping to do the same here on the first floor with the lab. It's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guests and everyone watching online to the grand opening of the Gift of Life's new Center for Cell and Gene Therapy. Today is not only the culmination of a dream, it's a natural extension of Gift of Life's mission to save lives. This center draws on 30 years of experience in this very important field, and it integrates seamlessly with our registry of 400,000 healthy volunteer donors, our dynamic recruitment team, our highly trained donor center case managers and logistics experts, and world-class apheresis center and its amazing medical staff. And because everything is located right here under one roof, we can ensure the highest quality and consistency of our services and products. Now, before I begin, I would like to take a moment to recognize that the past eight months have not been easy for any of us. The pandemic has affected every aspect of our lives, and our work here at Gift of Life has been no exception. But our incredible staff has risen to the challenge because cancer doesn't stop for COVID or anything else. And I am proud to say that they haven't missed a beat. In fact, we have already facilitated more transplants so far this year than in all of last year combined. My sincere thanks to our heroic stem cell donors for stepping up to pay it forward despite the stress and anxiety of doing it during a global pandemic. And my thanks to our constituents for standing by us, continuing their support despite uncertain economic times. And so today, we enter the next phase of our strategic plan to improve outcomes for patients battling blood cancer and many other terrible diseases. And our commitment to provide every patient with an equal opportunity to benefit from the treatment that can save their lives has never been greater. A signature service of this new center will be a bank of donated cells available on demand for transplantation, engineering for immunotherapy and gene therapies, and ethical research. And it's with an eye towards innovation that we will call upon our partners in the highly regarded South Florida Life Sciences Corridor to partner with us on some very exciting initiatives. This center truly represents the next step on Gift of Life's journey to help more patients than ever before. 
And as I switch proverbial hats, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't add that there's a naming opportunity mm -hmm. available in association with this new center. We're seeking a charitable gift of $3 million, and your family name, company name, or foundation name can be associated with the great work that's happening here. And Mr. Mayor, if you happen to know anybody in our great city, um, I would be honored if you would let me know. And now, for the ribbon cutting. Let's make sure that we've got this correct here. All right. Okay. As Mayor Singer and I prepare to cut the ribbon here in person, I invite our board of directors to join us virtually online. And immediately following, we will have a real-time tour of part of our laboratory and a question and answer period with our amazing scientific experts. And now, on the count of three. Yep. One, two, three. Ah. One more time. Yay. All right, we finally got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Singer. Oh, yes. OK, now we're going to. Uh, Take a moment to head over to the, uh, to the laboratory where we'll have a little tour and uh, some questions and answers. So as I head out here into the laboratory, I'd like to, uh, to begin by stating that um, the, uh, the journey for um, stem cells that will be stored here and provided for transplant and to cell and gene therapy developers all start with healthy volunteer donors from the Gift of Life Registry who will donate upstairs on the sixth floor at the Adelson Gift of Life Be the Match Collection Center. So we're going to start our journey over here in uh, our cell processing area, which is the first step. And I'd like to uh, introduce Andrea Pina, who is our senior biobank specialist, who's going to share a little bit more about this very exciting technology. Andrea. Thank you, Jay. Hello, everyone. How are you? I'd like to introduce you to our beautiful laboratory that we have here. And this is one of our first steps in our stem cell collection um, processing that we're going to be doing. So when the donors have completed their collection, they will bring down their product and we will inspect the integrity of the bag and make sure all of the labeling and the QA documents are verified before we begin. We will then use our sterile tube welder to sterilely weld our processing bag set with our collection bag set. With this device, we absolutely avoid the possibility of contamination entering the bag via one of the ports here with the spike sheath. We then come to the CPAX, which is manufactured by Cytiva. And the CPAX is an amazing instrument in that it uses technology with centrifugal force and optic sensor to sense the different types of cells in which they will transfer them to, to the different bag sets that are on the processing bag set itself. This process takes anywhere from 30 minutes to about 45 depending upon how much starting material that we have and at the very end we will have a filled concentrated bag set with our stem cells and also other immunological cells as well. This completes the processing of the stem cells and then we're going to move over to an instrument that's called the CPAX. I'm sorry the smart bag. The SmartMax is also manufactured by Cytiva, and this is an, also an amazing instrument in that it uses three different components when we're ready to add our cryopreservation media. So at this point, the cells are ready to be mixed with cryopreservation media, pretty much is going to encapsulate and protect the cells during the freezing process so that they do not form crystals and they do not burst and become shocked. So between these two metal plates, this instrument will keep the product between two to eight degrees, and it, it will use these air pockets as well to make sure that all of the components of our stem cell collection and our cryopreservation medium mix homogeneously. So it maintains it mixing very well. It maintains it at two to eight. And then after this process, we are ready for the last step, which is the freezing parameters, which I will explain to you in a little bit. Thank you, Jay. Absolutely, Andrea. One quick question for you. Um, so typically in the past, cells would be processed in what we call a biological safety cabinet like we have over here. 
Um, but if I understand correctly, um, this system enables you, because it's closed, a functionally closed system, to do that without doing it in, in that condition. Is that correct? You are correct. So the Cytiva system with the back set uses a closed system, which means that the blood components do not come into direct contact with the air. With that, we're able to keep the product as sterile and use a septic technique as possible to avoid open processing, which would need to be done in a biosafety cabinet and or in a clean room setting as well. With this system, everything is completely closed from start to finish, so we deem the product's integrity sterile. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Andrea, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Now we're going to head over to, uh, to the testing area where we do hematology testing and flow cytometry testing. And with me is Farida Khan, who is our medical technical um, supervisor here at Gift of Life to share a little bit about what happens here. Thank you, Jay. Hello, everyone. Yes, so we have a hematology analyzer. This is the Sysmex XN1000. It is a very reputable hematology analyzer, and we use that to perform our CBCs. And if you come with me, we also do flow cytometry testing. <clears throat> And this is one of two flow cytometers that we have here. This is the Batman Coulter Cytoflex. We also have the Batman Coulter Navios EX. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, tell me a little bit about, uh, this all sounds very uh, complicated flow cytometry. Can you put it in layperson's terms exactly what we're doing here with this equipment and why it's so important? Absolutely, Jay. Yes, flow cytometry sounds complicated, but it actually is. It's the name of a complex but amazing technology that uses lasers and another uh, complex term called hydrodynamic focusing, which basically means that it allows us to be able to pull the cells through one by one. And what flow cytometry does is um, allow us to enumerate or count and get details or phenotype different types of cells, in our case, stem cells. Okay, and, and from the patient's perspective, why is this so important? This is very important because in order for the transplant center to successfully transfuse or transplant a patient, they need a specific number of cells. This is how they ask of us um, to do the collection in order to provide them with the cells that they need. The flow cytometer is important because this is the equipment that is able to count those cells so that we know throughout the process if we are on track to providing the number of cells needed and at the end if we are providing them with exactly what they need to successfully transplant. Wonderful. So what I, I, just to, to try to understand this, um, is it similar to um, me going to a pharmacy and getting uh, some medication that's a certain dose? Would that be um, equivalent to the, the dose of these biological drugs that, that we're producing here? Absolutely. That is exactly how it happens. We receive a prescription with a request for a dose. And then we have to ensure that we're able to provide that number of cells or dose of cells. And so we have to count periodically th um, throughout the process with the flow cytometer to ensure that we are meeting that dose. Wonderful. And, and lastly, um, in the cell and gene therapy um, field, which, uh, which this lab will be involved in, um, can you tell me a little bit about what um, additional uh, things this, uh, this technology can do for that? Absolutely. Um, so flow cytometry can be used for a wide variety of applications. One of the ways in which it will be used to support the cellular therapy lab and um, the goal for expansion, which Fran will elaborate on in a little bit, is that it is able to tell us how well we're separating the cells and how well they're surviving that process, um, also known as viability. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, Farida, thank you so much for explaining it to this, uh, this to us in terms that we, as lay people, can understand. Yeah, really really appreciate it. Thank you. thank you. And now we're going to uh, to head over to uh, to speak to Dr. Francesca Gulo, who is Gift of Life's scientific director, and she's going to share with us a little bit about what she's doing at this station. So, Dr. Gulo, please tell us what's uh, happening over here. Hi, Jay. Hi, everybody. So I'm here with stem cell vision, which is a wonderful instrument that can perform uh, the colony forming unit assay called CFU assay, which is an assay that can actually detect the potency of hematopoietic stem cells. So basically with this assay, we can actually evaluate the ability 
of hematopoietic stem cells to differentiate into blood lineages. The great advantage of this machine, Jay, is that this machine can actually automate and standardize the CIFU assay, replacing the manual count of hematopoietic colonies that was usually performed with a microscope. And of course, this manual process is subject to a very high variability, which is related to the users. So also, Jay, I want to mention that <clears throat> the CFU assay that we perform with the STEM vision is part of our release criteria of our product. And this is extremely important for us because it gives us the possibility to have a, fully, a full control of the functionality of the hematopoietic stem cells before and after cryopreservation. Okay, so let me see if I understand. So um, Farida was talking about the flow cytometry and getting the, uh, the uh, number of stem cells or the dose. In, in what you're doing over here, are you, you're talking more of the, the potency and the functionality of those cells? Correct. So we want to make sure that we know the number of hematopoietic stem cells that we isolate. And in that case, we'll be using the flow machine. But at the same time, we want to know that our stem cells are functional before and after the cryopreservation. Uh, process. Wonderful. And this machine is extremely helpful in this process. Wonderful. So as scientific director, can you also shed some light on some of the uh, innovations that uh, we're lo looking to do here, some of the, the R&D, the research and development? Absolutely, Jay. This is extremely exciting for us at Gift of Life. So in future, we want to start some studies involving the in vitro expansion of hematopoietic stem cells, because we know that the potential of hematopoietic stem cells is huge. We can, those stem cells can really treat lots of blood disease. However, the limitation associated with stem cells is that the number of hematopoietic stem cells is very low in peripheral blood. So what we want to do here, we want to expand those stem cells in vitro so that we can increase the number of stem cells and we can make our transplants more efficient. I'll give an example, Jay. Here in house, we can isolate the blood from one super donor. And when I say super donor, I refer to a person that has a very um, common HLA phenotype. So we isolate the blood, and then we isolate the stem cells. We culture those stem cells here, and then we generate multiple batches that can help then multiple patients. So eventually, we will be in the position to use just one donor to help multiple patients. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, we, we've been talking a lot about transplants, um, but the donors who will be donating upstairs will also be um, helping patients um, now and into the future with um, cell and gene therapies, where the cells that are donated are used as the building blocks or the okay. starting material. Could you explain a little bit about that? Yes. So we want to, here at Gift of Life, we want to really support the cell therapy field. So what we would, and we know that one of the limitations associated with the field is the starting materials. So we, it's really important to help this company with the starting materials. So since we can do everything in house, like you mentioned before, from the collection to the cryopreservation of the cells, we want to be in a position to help this company with the starting materials that they will need to generate C34 cells or CAR T, for instance. Wonderful, wonderful. And we have that registry of 400,000 eager donors who are um, healthy and willing to save a life. And this is one way to be able to really grow the number of lives that we save. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Really, thank really you. appreciate it. Dr. Thank Gulo, you. thank you. All right. Now we're going to uh, head over into our biobank for the final part of our tour, where we're going to catch up again with, uh, with Andrea. And she's going to share a little bit um, with us about um, what we do in the field of cryopreservation or freezing those cells. So Andrea, welcome. Welcome back. Welcome so back. maybe hello, you could hello. share a little bit with us about what you do in the biobank over here with respect to the uh, freezing process. Of course. This is our Via Freeze Duo. In essence, this is a control rate freezer. When we're ready to bring down our frozen product down to our final containment in the liquid nitrogen container or freezer, what we want to do is slowly bring down the temperature. So we have added our cryopreservation media, which encapsulate and encloses all of the cells to make sure that when it goes into the freezing process, it doesn't form crystals, it doesn't burst, and the shocks are not in a state of shock. So this will slowly bring down the temperature of your cells until a proper setting, which is normally around 80, negative 80 or colder, and then our product is ready to go into our liquid nitrogen freezer. 
Right next to me, you will also see a minus 80 freezer. In this minus 80 freezer, we will contain all of the in-process QC samples. So we will contain all of the sterility samples in here, anything that's needed to go for testing for endotoxin or mycoplasma. If we needed to do any stability studies or counts, we have QC samples that we do in process and post process. And now I'm basically going to show you what the cassette looks like with the final product inside when we're going to transport it from its freezing curve that we have completed with the control rate freezer to our liquid nitrogen freezer. So we're gonna open our first containment here. And this is the cassette of what our final product will be enclosed in when it goes into our liquid nitrogen freezer. I'm going to place it on a rack, and then if you follow me, we will place it inside of our freezer. Now the, fro now the product is completely contained in the appropriate containment vessel for long-term storage. This liquid nitrogen freezer keeps liquid nitrogen at the very bottom and in the container itself keeps it in the vapor phase. Normally this temperature um, roughly goes through negative 180 to negative 195 degrees Celsius. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you for, for con completing this whole journey of the cells from being collected upstairs in the collection center down here into the, uh, into the lab and then ultimately going out to the transplant centers or the cell and gene therapy developers for that further manufacture. We appreciate it. No problem, thank you. And now we're gonna wrap things up with a little question and answer period with our uh, scientific uh, experts. So we're going to head out right over here. And uh, there is a chat box if you haven't already seen it and we welcome people to please enter their questions in the chat box. And we're gonna take a few minutes just to answer some of those questions. And with us we have, we have Tevin who's going to, uh, to field those questions for us. So, uh, so Tevin, thank you for, uh, for helping us out, and maybe you could uh, kick us off with the very first question. Absolutely, Jay. So our first question is, how do you select super donors? Okay, great, great question, and um, Fran touched on that a little bit. Um, so uh, super donors are um, donors in the registry. You know, we think all of our donors are super donors, first of all, okay? Let's, let's make that clear. But, um, but super donors are donors in the registry with very special um, genetic characteristics. It could be um, their tissue type or a particular um, allele um, or combination of antigens. Um, it could be their age range. It could be their gender. It could be their body mass index. Um, it could be their CMV status, cytomegalovirus status, um, their blood group, a whole host of, uh, of possibilities. And, um, and the, uh, the, the centers will select um, donors who they are most interested in. Um, and we, as we build our biobank, will do the same. And those will be the donors who will donate those cells upstairs and then we bring them down here. Great, excellent. So another question came in, pretty scientific. Uh, will you grow stem cells here? Ah, okay. Dr. Gulo, that's you. Yeah, this is a great question, thank you. Yes, we will definitely grow cells in our cell therapy lab. And our idea is to expand uh, hematopoietic stem cells in vitro in the presence of cocktails of small molecules and uh, cytokines. And of course, uh, our goal is to expand these cells as much as possible. However, we wanna make sure that these stem cells still, still maintain their stemness, which is the property of these stem cells to actually function in vivo. So yes, we will definitely start these studies hopefully next year. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, we got a general Kevin. audience question come in. Uh, why is it important to freeze the cells in this process? Okay, would you like to answer that? Sure, that's a great question. So after we do the processing of the stem cells, we have two avenues that we can take. We can either continue with the isolated cells 
and expand and then manufacture to create more doses and then ultimately cryopreserve them or automatically cryopreserve them after we have obtained them through the process of the CPEX. The idea is with higher manufacture, you're able to have more yield, more doses, and ultimately more patients that you're able to treat with these um, different doses that we were able to manufacture and place in our containment with our liquid nitrogen freezer. So in order to keep these cells in a state where we are able to use them later, we would have to freeze them down and keep them asleep until we thaw them and wake them back up in order for us to be able to use for treatments and transplant centers. So the idea is to preserve and use as much as possible with the idea of keeping the intact properties of the stem cells themselves. Wonderful. And you know, I, I'd like to add that um, while historically uh, transplants have been largely um, fresh, transported fresh, where a courier comes here and takes them by hand on an airplane um, to their destination, um, during the period of the uh, pandemic, during coronavirus, uh, almost all of the stem cell products have been frozen, um, just like you see here, um, so be just simply because of all of the travel restrictions and challenges associated with getting those, tra those transplantable products to their destinations. Um, but, uh, but there's um, a lot of change going on, a lot of very exciting things happening in the cell and gene therapy industry, which will require these services. So wonderful question. Great. We have another question that rolled in. What is the advantage of stem cell therapies over traditional bone marrow stem cell transplants? Sure. And uh, I'm happy to, uh, to field that as well. So um, this is really a burgeoning field. You know, it's, um, it's still somewhat in, in its infancy. You know, you might, might consider it, you know, a 20-story um, a, a, a building. Maybe we're on the first or second floor here. Um, so there, the, uh, the ability to do these, uh, to take cells from donors and, uh, and manufacture those into cell therapy products and gene therapy products. You know, a lot of people have heard in the news about CAR T cells and CAR NK cells. Um, these are all uh, treatments that are emerging um, to be able to help people um, not just with hematologic malignancies, but hopefully in, as we go into the future with solid tumors and other conditions. And that doesn't eliminate the need for, for marrow or stem cell transplants. Those remain very important, and sometimes they're even used in combination with each other. Um, but the reality is, is that this is a very rapidly evolving field, and we want to be able to help patients in any way possible. And we have these wonderful donors in the registry who are ready and willing to make that happen. Gotcha, amazing. Thank you for that. Another question came in, uh, scientifically technical. How long are stem cells able to be stored? Ah. That's a very really good question. We don't know yet because we haven't started our experiments yet. But our plan is to run a few experiments and to see how long we can actually keep our cell product in liquid nitrogen. So we will start with one year. And during this year, we will check the viability of the cells, the functionality of the cells, and the number of stem cells. And then we will continue. So I will give you an answer probably in one <laughs> or two years. Now, what, what, I, what I, we can add is that um, there's tremendous experience in the umbilical cord blood field, which are also frozen cryopreserved products. And just give the, uh, the example of New York Blood Center, um, Dr. Pablo Rubenstein from New York Blood Center, who was a, 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 you know, amazing in this field since the very, very early days. Um, those, those products are frozen um, and, and available uh, for patients in need that are, that are 30 years old already. So I think there's a good track record that we're building on here. Absolutely. Great. So in addition to that, who will have access to the biobank samples, and how are they securely being stored? Huh? For me? Yeah. That's a good question. So our lab is very, very well secured. We have different aspects of how we keep our security. There's only allowed personnel that are able to come into the laboratory area. They need to have special granted access to come into the laboratory area. The same goes with all of the equipment. You have locks and passwords in order to obtain access to use the equipment. There's also certain doors that you must be able to get through with the same type of access in order to access the room that has the, um, the products inside of the liquid nitrogen freezers. All of our information, all of our data, and everything that we do during processing is traceable. It must be kept under top guard. We follow HIPAA. 
We must also follow different criteria for FDA and 21 CFR for manufacturing. So here, the biggest emphasis besides keeping the quality and the integrity of the product is to make sure that we keep as much security and as much on hands um, uh, vigilance to all of the things that we do here at Gift of Life. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. All right, let's, uh, let's take one more question. Gotcha. We've got another scientific question. Uh, in the processes, do you use DMSO to cryopreserve samples? Yes, we will. And uh, we will use, we know already, 10% DMSO. So we are going to use the standard amount of DMSO. Yep. And, uh, and by the way, there's some exciting things happening in the industry that, um, that might even impact um, the way that, uh, that cells are uh, frozen. So um, everyone should be on the lookout because, as I said, this is a rapidly growing and evolving industry. Exciting things to come. Yes, and I can add that lots of companies are trying to develop uh, freezing media without the MSO, which, as we know, is toxic for the cells. Yes. So yeah. we are keeping our eyes open. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, as we uh, wrap up here um, on our tour, I would just like to thank everybody out there who tuned in to join us um, for this uh, landmark occasion for Gift of Life, where we hope that, um, that uh, this new laboratory and this new center will help more patients than ever before. Um, and I'd also uh, like to, um, to add again, um, switching hats here, that there is a naming opportunity available for the center so that you can be a part of our great work. And, uh, and finally, um, there will be a couple of slides that will be coming up on your screen, and I'd like you to take, pay special close attention to it. Um, one is um, events that are coming up, and uh, there's a number of virtual events that are uh, coming up that Gift of Life is hosting over the course of the next couple of months, and we encourage you to go to our website and, uh, and jot them down and register and, uh, and attend and have a great time with us. And then we have a couple of patients who we are actively searching for. You know, we search for 9,000 patients a year. And, uh, and there are some patients who simply, no matter how hard you try, just have great difficulty finding a match. So uh, we run public campaigns with, uh, with those patients and their families. And that includes, which you may see on your screen, um, three and a half year uh, Sloan, 10-year-old um, uh, Evan, and Karen from California, who's a mother and grandmother and is uh, truly rocks, she's amazing. We want to save their lives. And the way that we do that is through people stepping up to the plate, like all of our amazing marrow and stem cell donors already in the registry. Um, it just takes a cheek swab to join the registry and help save a life. So please visit our website, giftoflife.org. Um, join the registry, make a donation, get involved. And thank you all again for participating in this historic milestone achievement with Gift of Life. And we look forward to sharing great things well into the future. Have a wonderful day.